In this video, we are going to provide an overview of the application layer and the conceptual and implementation aspects of network application protocols. All of you have been using a whole bunch of applications. The most common applications are email, web, text messaging, P2P file transfer, streaming videos like YouTube, Hulu, voice over IP like Skype, and then there's real time video conferencing, social networking, applications such as Facebook, Twitter, etc. So how do you design these network applications? To design these network applications, what we will have to do is we'll have to write programs. Now programs that run on different end systems. Now these programs will have to communicate with each other over the network. For example, there is a web server software that communicates with the browser software at our computer. Now, the important thing to understand is that the application layer is only written at the end host. You do not need to write software for the network core devices, the routers, the switches, all the intermediate nodes of the network do not, do not have the application layer. The application layer only runs at the end host. Now, so they communicate with each other, the application layer at one of the end hosts is going to communicate with the application layer at the other end host logically, and none of, there's no implementation of the application layer at the intermediate routers. So there are two application architectures. The first one is the client server architecture, and the other one is the P2P architecture. Now, in the client server architecture, there is a server which we assume to be always on. It has a permanent IT IP address, and there are a whole bunch of sometimes servers that are located in data centers. For example, a company like Facebook or WhatsApp might have a whole bunch of um, servers to which the clients connect to. So that is why they have to be always on because the client might want to connect to the server at any given point in time. Now, clients, they need not be always on. They come up intermittently and they're intermittently connected and they communicate with the server for accomplishing a whole bunch of tasks. Now they may have dynamic IP addresses and these IP addresses can change over time. Now clients in general do not communicate with each other directly. For example, if there are two WhatsApp clients that have to send messages to each other, the message is first sent to the WhatsApp server and then from the WhatsApp server, the message is sent over to the other client. Now in a P2P architecture, there is no always on server. Now the the clients or the peers communicate with each other directly. Now, peers request services and content from other peers and they provide certain service or content to uh, some other peers. Now, the, the, the way a peer-to-peer -peer architecture works is every peer that enters into the system brings some amount of capacity in terms of network bandwidth and then it has some content which it can share with other peers and it also requires certain content which it can download from other peers. Now, peers can they are intermittently connected, they can disappear whenever they want, and they are mobile and the IP addresses can also change. The management of a peer-to-peer -peer architecture is way more complex than a server-to-client architecture, but peer-to-peer -peer systems are distributed in nature and they don't need a server that actually coordinates all these different clients. Now, whether you want to use a client server client architecture or a peer to peer architecture, you will need to write programs that communicate with two peers or the client and the server. Now, these programs are essentially processes that run within a host. Now, if there are two processes that run within the same host, they communicate. Uh, they communicate with each other using the inter-process communication, which is defined by the OS. However, here these two processes are running at different hosts. For example, one process might be running at the client side and the other process might be running at the, at the server side. So th the way these processes would work is the client process would generally initiate the communication and the server process that is waiting to be, con wait that waits to be contacted would be contacted by the client process. Peer-to-peer -peer, uh, architectures also have similar processes that communicate with each other. Now let's look at to how these processes can communicate with each other. Now the application layer has a whole bunch of these processes. 
and each process communicates with another process through something called a socket. Now sockets, you can think of them as a door. And what the application does is it, whatever it wants to send passes through this socket. So the application layer has these processes and the processes have a whole bunch of messages that they want to send. And every message has to be shoved out of this door, which is the socket, such that it can be received by the transport layer. Now, at the receiving end, the transport layer, what it does is when it receives transport layer segments, it has to assimilate them together and push it through this door or the socket such that the application layer process can actually receive it. For processes to communicate with each other and to send messages, there must be a way to identify different processes uniquely. The first such an identifier is the IP address. Now every host device has a unique 32-bit IP address. The natural question that arises is, is an IP address sufficient to, uh, to identify a process? The answer is no. This is because many processes can be running on the same host and all these processes will have the same IP address. Therefore, along with an IP address, what we need are port numbers. IP addresses and port numbers together can uniquely identify a process. For example, for an HTTP server, the port number is 80, and for a mail server or the SMTP server, the port number is 25. To, to send messages to an HTTP server, for example, gaia.cs.umas.edu, the IP address that we would use is 128.119.245.12, and the port number will be 80. With this, we'll conclude this video.